Well, I'm glad to be here, uh, though I'm not uh, into uh, what is happening in South Africa. I mean, you know, it's, uh, we learn from far, a little bit here, a little bit there, but not really a thorough study of what is going on. So my comments <coughs> will be more general than focused on a specific case like uh, he, he did, which, uh, you know, was very important for me too, uh, a learning experience of so what actually <coughs> is happening and uh, how it can be understood. I was just wondering whether we can also <coughs> start looking elsewhere what can be seen as maybe not necessarily the same but close to <coughs> uh, uh, to see the environment the world environment in which this is also happening <coughs> uh, we are told that the world has become a village, but this kind of village where you have almost everywhere people being barred or mistreated, not because of what they have done, but because of what they are. <coughs> uh, Woman, youth, black youth, uh, foreign, a believer in a wrong religion. <coughs> uh, so all these people are being mistreated for what they are, and sometimes even killed. Mass graves in Malaysia, when you look into it, it's mostly a certain minority being <coughs> treated that way. Uh, mass grave in uh, Eastern Congo uh, and uh, I'm sure there are mass graves where the Islamic State is operating and you, you have the feeling that <coughs> there too it's a question of not what they've done, but what they are. <coughs> uh, in uh, 2002, I think it was, President Bush said, they envy us for our way of life. They envy our way of life. It's like saying, They should be made to feel we are superior, <coughs> more or less. And we can do whatever we want to do. Uh, in the past, because we can also look a little bit in the past, the Ku Klux Klan in the US was never conceived as a terrorist. They were acting, the idea was to promote white supremacy. You know, blacks in face of end of slavery should know that white supremacy was still there. <clears throat> so normalize that situation so that a black person can be hanged and seen more or less as a norm. <coughs> uh, now, police violence in the US against particularly black youth is almost like saying 
before Obama equal after Obama. Uh, after Obama equals before Obama for you. Don't think your dignity is going to be treated otherwise. <clears throat> um, the movement to fight Polish violence in the US, they come to the conclusion that, in fact, the police is accused of disrespecting black people. In other words, denial of dignity, <coughs> uh, which is also what even in Egypt they were asking. Uh, uh, people of Egypt want dignity and, and so on. So, <coughs> I guess what I'm trying to say is that maybe we should also say that the kind of environment uh, worldwide where we are, the neoliberalism essentially, and the kind of the state that goes with it probably is an environment for this kind of uh, genophic big attacks, a treatment of differences. <clears throat> Differences in themselves don't lead to conflict. They have to be a way of transforming differences into discrimination before conflict can happen, before, before reviolence can happen. So it is this, uh, I call it political subjectivity, which start treating differences as a discrimination which leads to uh, those kind of uh, uh, com conflict. Now, let me give you also some other cases. <coughs> In Congo Brazzaville, two phases. The first phase, uh, about uh, a year ago. Now there's a second phase of expulsion of the DRC Congolese. Uh, but I am color. That's uh, how the, the, the team goes. Now, these people have done nothing. Even those who have papers have to be expelled and their property uh, confiscated. <clears throat> they are beaten up. Uh, uh, one woman pregnant even had to give birth while the police was terrorizing her. <clears throat> uh, now, the, the, the idea behind this is the, 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 the subjectivity, the political subjectivity of a minority ruling afraid, very much afraid, of the majority in the country. And because now the minority president wants to have a third mandate, the majority is opposed to it, it creates an environment in which the problem is shifted elsewhere. So now the problem is <coughs> the DRC Congolese rather than the, the, the fact that, first of all, he can't have a third mandate. And so he goes to speak to the ethnic group of his, and saying, in substance, you know, our group shouldn't lose this power. You help me, we should continue. Oh yes, you must continue. Now, <laughs> so, the, so there is a sense in which he's calling it the domains of rule, you know. and the domain of rule can be yes, civil society and civil society, but it can also get the lining of ethnic yes. affiliations. <coughs> um, so now that we are in the second phase in the Congo Brazzaville, uh, the RC Congolese are being kicked out uh, brutally and sent uh, back home, even those who have 
decided that their home was in Como Brother. <coughs> um, in uh, the the situation that is happening also in uh, Yemen, I, I, I personally have uh, been puzzled because a whole coalition of Arabic countries bombing Yemen to uproot the Houthis. At least that's how it is presented. <clears throat> uh, you know, at some it sounds like these people have no right to be in Yemen. And they are Yemenis. Uh, and the very notion that a president can go into exile and ask this country of, of his exile to go bomb his country so that he can remain in power. I mean, it, it, it's just uh, it, very difficult to, to understand unless you we can see some of these uh, sort of forms of uh, politics going on. Um, but also you have internal displacement as a politics of ruling particular <coughs> group, and also, as he said, a form of accumulation. Because when you are displaced, all your belongings and the land especially, yeah, now are taken over by other people. And most likely you won't get them back. <coughs> uh, and also in strange sort of, I think, domain we can say. I don't know if it is happening here, but in the DRC it happens. Irresponsible parents who find it difficult to raise their own children accuse the children of being sorcerer and they are thrown out on the street. <coughs> uh, there is no proof that these are sorcerers, you know, in any case. But, but they are thrown into the street. Yeah? And there is a normalization of the sense that it is normal to be without any home, without any house. It's normal to be eating in the garbages of the rich. <coughs> uh, <coughs> and and the, the state doesn't seem to react to these things. So that, but you notice also that in the budget, the social aspect of the budget is declining all the time, uh, or making promises that we're going to take the social next budget. And the budget comes, you look at the budget, the social element is not. Uh, <coughs> while we celebrate the high rates of growth, the social is <coughs> marginalized. Um, uh, so, and, 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 and the last uh, strange thing which we have uh, noticed uh, at least in the DRC is that uh, yeah, there's a you know, French writer who used to say that the, we, we become all equal when we are dead. Uh, the body, you know, dead, the body is equal, whether it is that of the, the wife of the king or, or normal, uh, anybody. <clears throat> but in the DRC, the dead poor now are treated as garbages that can just be thrown in a mass grave. 425 bodies 
throne yeah. in one head. And, you know, these, these are garbages, essentially. And, uh, so that we have come even to that kind of consideration that even the, the poor dead <laughs> cannot be treated, you know, characterally as we have to treat the, the dead. Um, so it looks like unless you are, you know, uh, a rich person or a person in a certain domain, uh, you cannot be treated with dignity, even when you are dead. <clears throat> um, uh, we, we also have been uh, saying that the in the rise, maybe you can call it the rise of the whole development of armament in connection of violence. Um, you see, fire power became seen as superior huh? since the ex extermination of the Mesoamerican people. In, in, in a, since then, it seems like if you have a fire power, huh, you can do whatever you want. And now, it's it, it very, um, how to put it, scary, because we have now even robot killers, drones that go, you know, uh, you know killing, you know, and almost indiscriminately. So that, those are the, that seem to be the general situation we are finding ourselves. Real absence of a politics of equality, <clears throat> politics of freedom, justice, truth, in brief, emancipatory politics is, is lacking. And the kind of state we have now is a state that is conducive to uh, the politics of violence, of mistreatment, of transforming differences into uh, discrimination and conflict. Uh, and, and so that may be the task. The general task, maybe, I'm just proposing it to you. It's probably a struggle against neoliberalism, per se, that probably would be focused on its, the forms of state that are, and civil societies that are, in fact, uh, functioning in the way uh, we, 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 we're now seeing in societies uh, going, lack of uh, solidarity. Uh, you know, in this country, it's about Ubuntu, shared humanity, but in fact, humanity is not being shared. <clears throat> uh, no solidarity, no equality. Uh, and solidarity also, I must say, uh, is not the same thing as charity. Because charity assumes that there are people who must be made to feel victimized for the charity to be deployed for them. 
but uh, solidarity is more about <laughs> to, to say like South Africans sharing <laughs> shared humanity and good um, and how are we going to get this political subjectivity or which is going to make sure that this state which is uh, the core of what we have been describing can be fundamentally transformed. Uh, uh, I was interested, I, I, I thought I would hear that, but, but maybe next, well, the next one is going to, I'm interested in what sort of ideas or slogans that came out in the march movement, in the march against the xenophobia, because that's how probably we can get a clue of what sorts of ideas that will be a political subjectivity to fight <coughs> uh, these uh, forms of, of the state. And I'm sorry, I just have to uh, start there and hoping that the few comments I made made sense and that we can have a conversation. Thank you very much. Look, I mean, I think it is important to realize that xenophobic discrimination takes place among the middle class in South Africa. Um, in lots of different ways. I had a Nigerian friend, for example, who was a highly qualified doctor uh, in Pretoria, um, but he, he was subjected to remarks that his, his job is not going to be renewed because they want to employ a South African and so on and so on. So um, it doesn't take violent forms, as I said, so therefore it's not quite so visible. Um, but Yes, xenophobia against foreigners, middle class foreigners, is there, and it exists. So the so discrimination occurs in all sorts of different ways, um, uh, including language, because if people speak in a language which the foreigner does not understand, therefore that foreigner is going to be excluded. Um, so, uh, I believe that in, um, the language question is a big issue, but I just want to mention one small thing. During what is called the struggle or in the 1980s, the mass popular struggle in the 1980s in this country, any meeting like this would be translated into three, uh, at least three other uh, languages. So the people could come who were not necessarily conversing in English, or in Afrikaans in that matter. So you, every time someone spoke, it was translated. It is possible to do it. Clearly, it's a bit cumbersome and the meetings last longer. But people have to learn to speak for short periods of time, uh, not ramble on like we have the tendency of doing in academia. But it's possible to do it. It requires will and organization. And in that way, meetings can be open to people in different languages. There's no, there's no real issue on this. Okay. That's all I want to say on, on, on that. I mean, it's a political question. Do we want everyone to attend and hence everyone to understand and everyone to contribute or are we going to exclude? And if we want everyone to attend and everyone to contribute, then what do we have to do in order for that to take place? You know, simple, really. Yeah? And so it's possible. On the question of the state, <coughs> sometimes the state condemns xenophobia. How are we to to read this. It's very interesting that if you read the piece by Stephen Friedman in, in, in Business Day, 
Uh, was it yesterday or the day before? He says uh, the South African government was celebrating Africa Day. So on one hand, celebrates Africa Day, and on the other hand, it goes around. Uh, and I think, uh, I think this idea of condemning xenophobia, you, you see, the impression one gets from what one hears from government, uh, spokesmen, women, or utterances, is that Xenophobia only happens when it's illegal violence against foreigners. But when, it's, when that violence is legal violence, then it's no longer xenophobia. It is about rooting out criminals. It's a very strange way of thinking. But xenophobia, it seems, from what we hear from those statements, is only when poor people attack other poor people. And that violence is then called xenophobia and it's bad. But when it's state institutions that raid and attack people, the army, for crying out loud, not just the police, the whole military, that's another thing that shows that in fact it's an enemy we're dealing with here, then that is not xenophobic. It's about creating, you know, it's, anti, it's about rooting out criminals. So, so it's, 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 it's a very disingenuous, or it's a very strange notion. You know, one can condemn xenophobia because xenophobia is chaos on the street, basically. Yeah? And that's what they seem to be worried about. Not the fact that foreigners are being attacked, but the fact that it's unregulated. And if you maintain that, then you could probably, you know, say both. Do both. That's the way. I, that's the way. I, 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 the only way I can make sense of it. You know, um, I can't make sense of it any other way. It's, it's, it's a mystery. Um, I think the the rest is yeah. yeah. Africa and yeah, yeah. closed into itself. Yeah. So, yeah. <clears throat> well, maybe I should say a general sort of idea, which. I'm just throwing it in. <clears throat> Apartheid has become globalized on the world. The US is building walls to prevent the Latin America through Mexico to get to <clears throat> Israel is building the walls. Soon we're going to have walls on the Mediterranean. <clears throat> so, so you have this uh, sort of, uh, you know, barriers and all of on the, on, the, on the continent, because it was all dealing with neocolonialism, which means that the, the, the colonial borders, which have been suddenly transformed into national but without real transformation of all the uh, territorial controls, uh, the colonialist left in terms of immigration policies and so on, they are still in place. <clears throat> I've been in the Dar Salaam for a long time and uh, teaching. When I get to the airport, <clears throat> so this Guy said, ah, but you know, uh, you should have gotten your visa <coughs> in Kinshasa because you see, uh, the DRC, uh, Nigeria, and all the people, they're not allowed to come here to get their visa here in, in, at the airport. So I'm there. And then uh, another Tanzania comes, oh, Professor, you are here. What is the problem? I said, uh, visa, uh oh, give you the passport. Now, it's a, uh, why is it that these sorts of uh, immigration regulations are so tight on the continent? Uh, 
You're probably right to say, maybe it's a form of, of xenophobia also, uh, that you can't really go from one country to the other freely. Uh, and, I, and I would suggest that part of the answer is still like or say, unless we transform. You know, our independence is we didn't raise the fundamental issue in Maui, which was that these countries have been created starting from the Berlin Conference and balkanized and organized certain colonial territories. Now are, these territories are being given independence. They should have said, look, uh, how do we go beyond the Berlin uh, determination of our countries? Maybe that would have made it uh, a possibility of reorganizing these territories, and maybe people now would have a say, because in fact, people don't have a say. And the people, the peasants especially, don't care about your immigration post. They find some way of going through. <coughs> people in the area I come from, way in the west, in the DRC, uh, born in Congo Brazzaville. So you have these villages. Their land is in Congo Brazzaville. Uh, so, so that's where they go to the farming. So how are you going to uh, say, OK, uh, you have to have a visa. And so <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it's, uh, <clears throat> but on the other hand, it's a question of uh, access to Treasury, I guess that's how I put it. I recently was in Kinshasa. To get out of the airport, I noticed there were 10 steps. 10. Here you pay taxes. Here, this one asks you a medical certificate. Oh, you know, you have to do something. So you get money. These are all you see. I check uh, your visa in Tanzania. But the time you've been doing some more money. So, ten steps. Why? Because many of these fellows who work there are not paid regularly. So, they pay themselves uh, the salary. So, the, the, the whole process of going through becomes very difficult, uh, yeah, very, very difficult. Um, and some people from some countries, it's even much worse uh, than others. And, and of course, like you were saying, uh, one has the feeling that the Europeans, you know, they, they have uh, some kind of uh, uh, right right of vetoes. <laughs> they go through without, you know, but these are the ones who have more money. Normally they should. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, that's, uh, you know, so there is this uh, sort of new colonial organization of the state, and the state uh, organizing the way it is, rampant uh, corruption and so on, make the whole issue of Immigration a little bit uh, cumbersome. Now, on my personal <laughs> question of uh, the rebellion, you know, uh, sometimes you, you may not know uh, ahead of time what you are getting into. <laughs> uh, I, I thought that. Even academic have civil obligation, civil uh, duties when it comes to the situation where you feel that things can be changed, huh? that you can actually get involved. So, so and, and 
I, I was supported by people that I thought also uh, knew better than myself. You know? I was in constant uh, touch with Mualimu on this. And uh, Mualimu said, yes, it was all right. So, uh, but once there, I found out that in fact uh, things were not the way I thought they were. And uh, so the only way now to get out of it was to come out with a politics of peace. How do we end this war and uh, go to peace? So we engineer this notion of inter-Congolese dialogue as a way out, more or less. Um, uh, unfortunately, the, the dialogue wasn't really a dialogue. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you, you have too many interferences. <laughs> and Congolese are not really talking to each other, more or less. You know? uh, suddenly it becomes a question of power sharing. Uh, how many soldiers you have, how many... Uh, so the more soldiers, the more power. <laughs> <laughs> so you have not resolved anything, basically, because the militaristic elements get more power. Uh, and, uh, because you think that if these people are satisfied, the, the war will probably end. <coughs> and so you give them more power. Um, then we argue and we say, oh, but this has to be inclusive. Uh, nobody should have a feelings of being excluded and so on. But in practice, uh, some people feel excluded. Uh, and uh, nothing done about it. And, and, and uh, like is usual on the continent, as I was saying yesterday, we are res resolutionaries. Okay. <laughs> what we agreed <laughs> in the intercommunist dialogue, very little implemented, basically. You know, most of the uh, uh, national reconciliation which was called for, uh, at the reconstruction of the army in a certain way, uh, justice, uh, you know, independent judiciary, all this, you know, it's like, uh, you know, so to say, what have you achieved? Did you achieve what you wanted? In, in a way, yes, in the sense that we managed to, 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 to end <laughs> the war by this dialogue. No, because we don't I don't feel that the outcome in terms of power arrangement was any better than before. Uh, so and now the issue is, <clears throat> because now we have learned armed rebellion doesn't resolve much. We have learned uh, elections in which people are not actually participating, won't solve it. So, so we're now thinking of how do we go about changing our society? You know, it, it, it's, uh, so we are in that process of rethinking the whole process. Um, <coughs> and the rebellion is not going to do it. Uh, elections in which a minority of people who know French are actually doing the democracy. <laughs> the majority who don't know French eh, hardly are understanding it was what is going on. Um, uh, and then you have also these controls uh, uh, who have uh, the fire power. The fire power who can threaten you, 
and uh, those who have money uh, who can buy the votes. <coughs> People who are so hungry, so I mean miserable condition, so that this guy brings you a sack of rice and uh, give you, you give me the vote. <laughs> Uh, let, let, let me just tell you one incident in the referendum exercise. First, the constitution text is printed on Saturday. Uh, 500 copies for 20 million uh, voters. <laughs> Within the 500 million copies, you have four variants of the text. You know, the, the text is not the same. <laughs> so, on Sunday, it's a referendum. <coughs> so, in one uh, poll where I went to vote, one woman, a hey, very bright woman actually, she comes there and said, but where is the picture of uh, Mr. Referendum? Because for, for me, I have to see the picture. <laughs> so, so, so the people say, oh, no, Referendum is not uh, a person. Mm -hmm. so, so, so what are we voting for? <laughs> and then you are voting the, the, the law of the land. Ah, so where is this law of the land? I, I, I mean, it, it was, uh, so they told him, no, you know, you, you just bought it. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see the, the sort of uh, uh, mirage uh, we are living in, uh, you know, so and now, very soon, we're going to have again an exercise of... Uh, in, in the rebellion, I missed being killed five times. You know, I, I, I came to believe that uh, really God loves me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do too, so. <laughs> you know, five times. <clears throat> wow. But somehow, uh, managed. That I'm still alive, really, I think, you know, uh, I, I should do something, continue to get something changed, actually. Uh, so that's what I mean when I say, I'm very, uh, with other people, deeply thinking, what, how can we now address our problem? Because some of these means and ways of doing it are now blocked, they are not effective. <clears throat> uh, one of the things I, I, I'm now thinking of is that the question of the language has to be resolved. Mm -hmm. has to be, you know, why do you get a minister of francophony and you have no ministry of the national languages? Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so that those who speak this language and that language, they can't more or less uh, communicate because there are no structures which say, in this province you speak Swahili, then you learn also Kikongo or Lingala, or you know, and, and vice versa, there's no such a thing. Uh, uh, so maybe if some of those uh, uh, structures are in place, literature is in a language which people can understand, maybe the content of democratization can improve. And that's what I'm thinking now. <clears throat> I'm sorry for being so long. <laughs> it's possible.